So we have our very special guest this evening. We have the Honorable Sean Richards, the Deputy Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis and the political leader of the People's Action Movement. Welcome, Mr. Richards. To keep in the promise. Good evening, Azad. Good evening, Tawana. I am happy to be here with you this evening. And as such, I say a very special thank you for having me as your guest this evening. Well, Mr. Richards, um, we are delighted to have you here. In fact, we have reached to the end of the road when it comes to Convention 2022 and the Facebook Live series. We've had many guests here, and so we've saved our political leader for the last. Well, we usually say the best for last. <laughs> but I don't want the other ministers to feel <laughs> jealous. <laughs> but we have saved the Honorable Sean K. Richards for last. How are you doing this evening? Let's start there. I am doing quite well this evening. It has been a magnificent week. As you are aware, we had our caucus last night. Uh, that event was very well attended. You had the election of the executive, which will take forward the People's Action Movement for the next year. Based on the results which were returned, it is quite obvious, in my view, uh, that the persons who attended caucus, the delegates of the party, are happy with the persons who, in whose hands they would have placed in the party's business in last year. I say that because when you look at the persons who were elected last evening, it is the very same persons who would have been executive members for the last year uh, that the People's Action Movement would have had as its calendar year. So the energy leading up to convention, does it feel different to you compared to last year? Because we were, we were in Hub City last year, now we're moving <laughs> to number eight, right? Well, for those who don't know, Hub City, of course, is Sandy Point, my constituency, constituency number five, SP, where the best be. <laughs> constituency number eight has a very hard act to follow in terms of the same level of energy uh, that we saw at convention last year in Sandy Point. However, constituency number eight, Kayon in particular, as the convention is being held at the St. Mary's Park in Kayon, has always supported the People's Action Movement. Therefore, I am expecting the people of Kayon to turn out and to have perhaps a greater level of energy than would have been exhibited in Sandy Point last year. The representative, the Honorable Eugene Hamilton, has been doing a very good job in terms of meeting the needs of the persons of that constituency. He has been an elected member of parliament since 2010, so he is not new in terms of the political scene. As a matter of fact, he would have contested elections even prior to that of 2010. Of course, my own constituents will be coming out to <laughs> give me full support. But you also have all of the other constituencies who we expect to have a very large contingent and so overall we expect it to be the best convention that the People's Action Movement has had to date. We have done a number of things differently leading up to this convention as compared to last year. It's a rally style convention as you are aware and so uh, this year we are giving uh, t-shirts to all of the persons desirous of attending uh, the convention. We have a number of activities leading up to the convention tomorrow evening for example. We have a beach lime at Ocean's Bar on Saturday. We have I think what is uh, considered to be a favorite activity uh, for the young persons and older persons too in terms of the bar hopping from constituencies 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 and 8. Hence we are building momentum leading to convention and as I said I expect it to be a fabulous convention. I expect it to be a fantastic convention, a convention in which we will be outlining how the People's Action Movement has been keeping the promise. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about this evening is, you know, a lot of young people are looking up to you. What can you tell us 
for persons who are interested in joining the political arena, what can you tell us and what advice can you give us? Because you would have entered into politics at a very young age. I think it would have been probably from age 29 and then you were elected at age 31, correct? Yes, you are correct. I would say to young persons, just like any other individual here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, you are full of ideas, you are full of potential. Uh, this country is one where I think we need to fully develop the country and we can only do so if we get the input of all persons. Uh, therefore, young persons need to come forward. Young persons uh, need to say to younger persons and to older persons uh, that I also have a contribution to make towards the development of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis and I am ready to make uh, that contribution at a very young age rather than waiting until I am older where perhaps the energy level isn't the same. As a matter of fact, when you take into consideration uh, that the majority of the voting population consists of younger persons, uh, then it is only natural, in my view, uh, that you should have a representative from that particular age group uh, being in politics, uh, being in parliament. Uh, that age group should be able to give ideas as to what are the concerns of the peers and what are some of the possible solutions that can be brought to be in terms of bringing those issues to the fore and bringing innovative solutions to those particular issues. As you outlined, I started at the age of 29. I don't regret it. I was elected at the age of 31 and I think I have been making my contribution and I still continue to make a contribution. I entered politics because as a young person I recognize uh, that you had a victimization is such a rampant and I felt uh, that I can make a difference and indeed I think if one has to scrutinize my record as a minister of government and even as an opposition member the record would show uh, that each and every single step of the way I have been advocating and making a difference in the lives of young people in particular here in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. My question to you is why the People's Action Movement? Because they, you could have chosen any party. There was a Labour Party, but why PAM? I chose the People's Action Movement first and foremost because the motto of the People's Action Movement is putting people first. Uh, that in itself speaks to a level of service whereby it's not about you, it's about ensuring uh, that you look after the full development of all of the people. Uh, the motto doesn't say PAM people, it says putting people first. It doesn't say putting yourself first. It is interesting to note that when the country became independent in 1983, the motto for the country is country above self. And so if you do a comparison, uh, between the motto for the People's Action Movement and uh, that of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, you see it's not about self, but it's about people, it's about the country. And uh, that in particular has attracted me to the People's Action Movement. The People's Action Movement also has a track record uh, that would endear anyone towards the People's Action Movement. When you look at some of the developments, the major developments which have taken place in this country, the People's Action Movement stands ahead of any other political party in terms of bringing meaningful development to St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay. I just want to touch on, you know, when the People's Action Movement was in opposition, what was that like for you as the leader <laughs> of the party? Well, firstly, let me say that when I began my stint in opposition in 2004, I was one of two political leaders. In 2004, we contested all eight of the seats in St. Kitts. It was a bittersweet victory for me because at the end of that election, I ended up being the lone parliamentarian for the People's Action Movement in Parliament. It therefore sweet from the point of view that you have contested your very first election, you have won. 
Uh, but of course, you don't enter into politics and contest an election hoping to be in opposition at the end of <laughs> the day. <laughs> It's sweet also because the Labour Party had a monopoly of all eight of the seats in St. Kitts at the time and so I was able to break that monopoly and so for me it meant that going forward the chances for the People's Action Movement would increase because of course persons would begin to look positively at the People's Action Movement and saying well okay this is a party that is gaining strength, the party now has a voice in the Parliament. So. While I enjoyed being elected at that point in time as one of the deputy political leaders, it wasn't the best feeling. However, I endeavoured to go into Parliament and to do my very best in terms of representing my constituents, representing all of the supporters of the People's Action Movement, but ultimately representing all of the people in St. Kitts and Nevis, especially those who were seeking a voice from the opposition benches at that point in time. In 2010, mm -hmm. there was sort of a, a similar return in terms of the results. The exception was that the Honorable Eugene Hamilton won his seat in 2010, so I was able to gain some you gain a partner. Uh, yes. Partner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Someone else. So I was able to gain a colleague in mm. Parliament in the person of the Honourable Eugene Hamilton. Of course, it made it easier for me eh, because eh, during any debate in Parliament, you have a time limit in terms of being able to contribute to the debate. You eh, say so it meant that what he wasn't able to say during debates or what I wasn't able to say during debates, eh, that one or the other could pick up on those particular issues. As I said earlier, I think in terms of that signal which was mm -hmm. being sent to the public that PAM is indeed regaining strength mm -hmm. by picking up that additional seat, mm -hmm. that message was further solidified within the minds of persons. I became the political leader of the party in 2012. The then leader, the Honorable Lindsey Grant, would have contested his first election in 2004, a second time in 2010. He wasn't successful and so in 2012 he decided to give up the reins of the leadership of the party. There was a contest between the Honorable Eugene Hamilton and myself and at the end of the day I won by one single vote. It wow. says to you the importance mm. of every single vote when it comes to our politics. And since then have been the leader. My fortunes changed in 2015 when I then became a Minister of Government and again of course in 2020. Okay, so you know we oftentimes joke around and say you know Sean's seat is the safest seat. We don't have to worry. How does that make you feel to know that the people of number five love you dearly? You usually win by a, a very big margin in my opinion. How did you manage to get that, that love and support <laughs> from the people, <laughs> consistently? Well, you have stated that it is a safe seat. Let us recall uh, that in 2000, Labour for the very first time would have won uh, that seat. However, when I entered politics and I have said Sean doesn't lose. <laughs> when I entered politics, I was determined that I was going to win uh, that seat. And so I did the work which was necessary to ensure that at the end of election day, that indeed I was victorious. However, it's not necessarily about being liked by persons. I think more so it is making a commitment to persons, standing by the commitment that you have made to persons, so that at the end of the day, at each election, persons are able to look at your record, they are able to look at what you have promised, and it goes back to the theme for convention, keeping the, keeping promise. the promise. I have made promises to the people, and I have kept the promises I have made to the people. When you are in opposition, you stand on the opposition bench and you advocate and you advocate and you advocate. And quite often, the government doesn't listen to you because it is felt that if you do the things 
that that opposition member is advocating for is that you strengthen the opposition member. That, however, didn't deter me from continuing to advocate on behalf of the people of Sandy Point. When I got into government eventually, some 20, 2004, 2015, so if you do the math, about 11 years later, mm -hmm. I began ensuring that many of the promises that I made to the people that those promises are uh, implemented. Question, you mentioned that you were in opposition, even though you won your seat consecutively, you were in opposition for 11 years. What was that experience like? I think I would have detailed some of it yes. just now. Perhaps the other aspects of it that I can speak to mm -hmm. would be as I said, advocating on behalf of persons and that sense of disappointment at the end of the day that here you are as a representative of the people, you speak on behalf of the people but merely because of the fact that you are not a sitting MP with the government side that you please fall on a deaf ear. When you look at persons suffering and you go and you make a case on behalf of those persons and nothing is being done to help those persons. Of course, it's not the, the best feeling. When you look at infrastructure within the constituency which is crumbling or which is in need of further development and you speak about it and nothing is being done about it, again, you, you can't feel satisfied about it. If you take a school, for example, and you know that there are issues with a school, you have leaking roofs, for example, you speak, you speak, you speak, and nothing is done. At the end of the day, it's not myself who is suffering, but it is the children, the future of the nation uh, that you have left to suffer. As I speak, I can recall one evening, for example, we had a political meeting in Sandy Point and when I left my house that evening I walked with a chair, a dining room chair <laughs> and of course persons wondered well why has he come to the political meeting with a dining room chair. When I finished speaking I said to them I am going to what was then Parkson, the old Parkson Hospital and I'm going to spend the entire night until morning on the step there, sitting down in my chair as a sign of a protest. What had happened back then is a decision had been taken to close that health institution. And I said, no, as a representative for this constituency, I'm not going to sit by and allow it to happen like that. And so, indeed, I went and I sat in that chair. And other persons joined me <laughs> uh, that evening until morning. Mm -hmm. uh, that of course forced the government to take a decision otherwise. I remember a second case mm -hmm. whereby the crossing guard for the Sandy Point Primary School had been sick for perhaps two or so weeks. And so you had that situation whereby the children were left uh, to try and pass between traffic on their own without the assistance of any crossing guard. I spoke about it. I made an appeal to the authorities to provide a temporary crossing guard so as to help to protect the lives of our children. No one took me on. One afternoon I called someone I said, you know, those safety vests eh, that you wear, eh, do you know where you can find one? And so someone provided me with one. So the morning, I got up mm. early enough when I expected children to start mm -hmm. arriving for school, put on my safety vest, went by the crosswalk, mm. the pedestrian crossing. I found the stop sign <laughs> that the crossing guard utilized uh, then <laughs> and I became the crossing guard for uh, that morning. It caused quite a stir but what I can say to you by midday <laughs> there was a temporary crossing guard <laughs> yeah. assigned to the school. 
you saw yes i had my challenges while in opposition but i also found a creative ways in some instances to get the government to take action hey, there's a gentleman who said to me i think it was two sundays ago hey, that he credits me for getting his home hey, this is a gentleman who supported the labor party year after year after year after year and i recall one night we had a political meeting and i spoke about his situation i said imagine this is the type of house that this gentleman is living in after all of the years of support he has given to the labor party he said by the next week construction began <laughs> on his house mm. so while it is a uh, that yes you are in opposition and you might be limited you don't allow the circumstances to make you feel uh, that you still can't achieve absolutely nothing on behalf of persons they are just a different way sometimes that you have to use to apply pressure to the sitting government to get things done i want to talk a bit about your projects that you are focusing on and before what we go into that one i know that he has some constituents who want to ask him some questions okay so sure we <laughs> we're gonna have the constituents ask some questions Rafael white sandy point now my question is mr richards if elected Prime Minister, how can we, as constituents, be sure that you would keep the promises you've made in your past speeches and presentation? Of course, and that if elected as Prime Minister, when I become the Prime Minister, I do intend to keep my promises. I've always said to persons that mm -hmm. actions speak louder than words. My actions to date have indicated to persons that I do keep my promises. I have made several promises to the people of Sandy Point and I have endeavored to keep those promises. When I was in opposition, for example, I spoke continuously about the development of the sporting facilities in Sandy Point. If one is to go to Sandy Point, one would recognize that the sporting facilities in Sandy Point have been transformed. I said to you earlier that I am a strong advocate in terms of young persons being given opportunities to develop themselves. I have done that as a Minister of Government in several different ways. Those who have been seeking the opportunity to own a piece of land, I have been able to assist hundreds of persons within my constituency in doing so. I said to persons that in terms of houses, I made them a promise uh, that more houses will be built, the houses will be more affordable, and several persons in my constituency, Sandy Point, have been able to see me keep uh, that promise. Persons have benefited from uh, bigger homes uh, with mortgage rates which are lower uh, than what NHC traditionally provided. Uh, there are several roads in the constituency that I said to persons, I promise you uh, that those roads will be paved. I remember, for example, in one budget debate, I spoke about the roads in Romney's ground. That had almost become a recitation because budget debate after budget debate, I spoke about the roads and the government just would not take me on. I remember the then a Minister of Roads saying to me eh, that that particular development was built by a former PAM parliamentarian and that parliamentarian should have put in the roads. I had to correct the then a member on the government side and said to him eh, that no, the area that I'm referring to, the government would have distributed the land eh, there. In my very first term as a Minister of Government, the roads in eh, that area and other areas within the constituency were paved. I spoke on several different occasions about what I would consider to be my promise relative to work at the schools in Sandy Point. I have been able to deliver 
on those promises. So I've kept the promise in terms of ensuring uh, that the schools have been upgraded. I've promised young persons and older persons and middle-aged persons opportunities for employment, opportunities not just for employment within government, but opportunities to become entrepreneurs. I have kept uh, that promise. So there are several different promises that I can speak to, which I have kept. Hence, in terms of my achieving my next political goal, which is to become the Prime Minister of the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis, I further say to the people of Sandy Point, but ultimately to the entire Federation, uh, that I will continue uh, that legacy of the People's Action Movement of keeping its promises I will continue to keep my promises to all of the people within St. Kitts and Nevis. Greetings, Minister Richards. I am Viandre Edwards of constituency number five. I would like to ask you a question. You have been a parliamentary representative for number five for almost 20 years, seven of which you have been a minister of government. My question to you is, what has kept you and keeps you motivated to be of service to the people of constituency number five and the people of St. Kitts and Nevis? I have never lost sight of the fact that I am a member of parliament first and foremost to serve people. Hence, I continue to ensure that I serve people. That is primarily uh, what has kept me motivated over the years. Uh, when you are able to see persons being satisfied, it gives you the motivation to continue because you want to see more and more persons getting that sense of satisfaction. When persons are able to come and say, thank you for assisting me with getting a scholarship to go overseas to study, and you see those persons return, you see those persons making a contribution towards the development of St. Kitts and Nevis. You see where, in terms of some of those persons who had been living a particular standard of living, being able to advance, it motivates you to continue because you want to be able to help other persons to achieve that very same success and even greater success. When you are able to assist persons with houses, when you are able to put in infrastructure, you see the joy eh, that it would give to persons, of course, you are motivated. And don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. there are some persons who you feel eh, that you can never satisfy. Mm -hmm. eh, but I think the majority of persons, <laughs> eh, they feel in that sense of empowerment, the feel in that sense of pride, and so you want to see more persons being able to experience that same feeling. So you become more and more motivated, not just to do for more persons, but to try and get the necessary resources, whether from within government or outside of government, you saw the pool of persons who you provide assistance to can increase. When you speak to persons, for example, who would have benefited from the roofing program undertaken by the government, now some of these persons basically had no comfort within their own homes. When it rained, no matter which room those persons would have gone into, water is coming inside of the house. Hmm when they're sleeping and they can't sleep comfortable. When you look at some of the videos which were produced, persons telling you they have to sleep with an umbrella mm. over them. <laughs> really? Yes. When mm. a person said to you they have to put a bucket here, a bucket there, etc. to catch the water and you're able to transform uh, that house so that you know persons can go to sleep and uh, if rain is coming, they enjoy the comfort of the rain. They could hear the rain beating on the roof, but they don't worry about the rain actually coming into the house. When you look at some persons who not only 
had to tangle uh, with rain coming. Uh, but in terms of, you look at the different sides of the house, especially those who had occupied a wooden house. And you could basically step from the outside and mm -hmm. look in the house and you're not looking through a window, of course. Uh, but the house is so dilapidated and those persons now basically in some instances have a brand new house uh, that motivates you to continue. Uh, when you visited some of the homes and persons telling you don't walk there and don't walk there uh, because the flooring is rotting and you have been able to make a difference for those persons, you are motivated especially in particular some of the older persons who have been living alone under such conditions you get that motivation to continue because you know you have made a significant uh, you have made a significant contribution in terms of the standard of living of those persons and i can go on and on in terms of examples as to how i am motivated to continue you know, you listed a lot of examples, but I'm still waiting for you to talk about the police station in Sandy Point. I know that was your baby for some time, how you always wanted that. Can you speak to that a bit? Yes, I can speak to the police station because, as you said, that was also one of my babies for quite a number of years. I went into Parliament, I spoke about the fact uh, that uh, the police officers uh, having competition with rodents <laughs> such as rats uh, to eat their food when you hear the police officers complaining about unsanitary conditions such as mold within the premises that mm -hmm. they occupied uh, back then when you take into consideration that the, the government had been paying rent mm -hmm. for a substantial number of years, perhaps over 20 years, yes. because the old police station had fell into disrepair. And so some twice, the police officer had, officers had to move into a different facility. Eventually, the fire services were separated from the police and the magistrate court also housed in the bay as compared to Sandy Point where it had been housed for a number of years. I spoke about the police station, I spoke about the police station. And even back then, when crime was at its highest, it still wasn't given priority in terms of ensuring that the police officers were able to work from a, within a facility conducive to the type of work that they do. Hence, when we got into government, I said the new police station has to be built. I am happy to say today that Sandy Point has the best police station <laughs> within the entire Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. You now have the police, the fire services, offices for customs and magistrate court under one roof. Uh, that police station was opened in December of last year and it is one of the pride and joy of the Sandy Point community. We have one more question from constituent. My name is Sarah Mason and I am here to do an interview with the Honorable Sean K. Richards. Excuse me, Mr. Richards, I have a question for you. What are your short-term and long-term goals or plans for constituency number five? Before you answer that question, let me say thanks to all of the constituents who have taken the time to ask me those questions. It says to me that my constituents are in tune and of course they want to ensure that in terms of my continued involvement, my continued representation as the Member of Parliament for Sandy Point that I will continue to ensure that there is development in Sandy Point. In terms of some of the short-term plans for Sandy Point, there's still some roads uh, which we need to pave. As a matter of fact, one is currently uh, being paved that is in the Roland Hill 
the Roland Hill area. We have some in the Farms Meadows area in particular uh, that we need to pay some attention to. You have some persons who would have received lands and houses within recent times in the Crab Hill area. You saw, of course, infrastructure in terms of roads in particular uh, also needed in uh, those areas. So uh, that would be one of the short-term plans for the constituency. There is still work to be done at the schools in Sandy Point. Ultimately, I would want to see a new nursery and preschool facility, perhaps under one roof within the constituency. That, of course, takes some time in terms of ensuring that you have the designs in place, land is identified to house that facility. Long term, I also want to see the Sandy Point thriving in terms of being a business hub, a business center within St. Kitts and Nevis. Hence, we want to ensure that we are able to attract different types of businesses to the Sandy Point community. When the Farmer Administration had advocated for the development of La Valley, to be quite honest, it was a development that I welcomed because in my view, it would have attracted other businesses to the Sandy Point community. Unfortunately, after wasting millions of dollars, nothing ever happened in terms of that particular development. We have been actively trying to find replacements for what had been envisioned there. For example, we had hoped that the Six Sense project would have gotten off in that area. It hasn't materialized. Uh, but we still continue to speak to potential developers uh, to bring significant uh, business developments to the Sandy Point community. You have a land in the community uh, which can be used for commercial development, which can be used for industrial development. Uh, that, of course, I, as I said, I would like to see. We have spoken about a bypass road mm -hmm. for the Sandy Point community uh, because when you look at the island main road and the number of vehicles uh, which would park on the island main road, it causes congestion. So a uh, bypass road is very much needed. That would, as I said, would be one of the long-term plans for the community. Ultimately, though, I think the development of any community is really about the people. And so in terms of providing opportunities for more and more persons in Sandy Point to advance, because I think once persons are able to advance, mm -hmm. it, they in turn add to the development of the community. They might mentor a younger person. Mm -hmm. They might provide employment for other persons within the community. They build a business, and as the business gets stronger, they're able to expand the business, maybe not just in terms of the size of that particular business, but they might venture into other businesses. So those are some of the long-term plans that I have for the Sandy Point community. Okay. I think we've had a very fruitful, engaging discussion here. I think that the Honorable Sharon Richards, the political leader of the People's Action Movement, the Deputy Prime Minister of St. and Nevis, and the next Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, has given us room for thought, growth, and for us to think about the People's Action Movement, where we will be going, where the country will be going. And I think when I think about his presentation today, I think about exactly what our motto is putting people first and our convention theme for this year keeping the promise he has emphasized so i wish to thank you for being here i wish to thank you for your service and i wish to thank those of you who has who have listened to our program uh, over the course of the past weeks I want to say thank you we've reached the end of the road please join us on Sunday 13th March at 2 p.m. at St. Mary's Park for a convention like no other 
as our leaders are committed to keeping their promise.